Last time we uh, finished talking uh, chapter seven, which was sort of the first law of thermodynamics or dealing with that, which was about energy. We're gonna pick it back up here, coming back forward uh, to chapter 16. And we're gonna talk about some of the rest of the uh, thermodynamic sort of properties. <clears throat> so we will obviously see in this chapter, uh, what we talked about in the previous chapter, delta H, uh, which is our enthalpy. And uh, as we talked about, it's really kind of the heat of the reaction. We will also add some other letters for the alphabet finally, like delta S, which will be some entropy, which is amount of disorder, which we'll talk about. We'll also talk about delta G, which is uh, Gibbs free energy. And kind of like the name implies, it is energy available to do some type of work. And of course, you know, what would this class be without tying all those things back to our good friend K and the equilibrium here. So we're gonna kind of, again, build off of uh, what we talked in chapter seven and talk about some other uh, important thermodynamic sort of values. <clears throat> so first off, uh, really what we're studying here obviously is uh, sort of thermodynamics and Really, for the most part, um, what we look at a lot is whether or not a reaction is uh, spontaneous. And sometimes people have maybe a wrong conception in terms of what spontaneous means, uh, especially in sort of this application. When we talk about it being spontaneous, again, it doesn't really refer to how fast or how slow the reaction is happening. Uh, sometimes people think spontaneous, then boom, you know, something happens really, really fast. That is the study of kinetics, which you talked about in uh, 200A, uh, deals with how fast or slow a reaction takes place. When we talk about a reaction being spontaneous in this context, what we're talking about is, you know, under those conditions, you know, are the conditions really right for that reaction to actually occur? Now that reaction could occur really fast, it could occur really slow, but in those conditions, if we sort of deem a reaction to be spontaneous, uh, that will mean it should occur. And again, it really doesn't have too much to do with how fast or slow. Again, that's more like kinetics is involved in that. So what we have here is a list of a, a number of physical and chemical processes which are spontaneous. Uh, water runs downhill, hopefully. A lump of sugar will dissolve the coffee uh, at one atmosphere and zero degrees Celsius. That is our normal sort of melting and freezing point for water. As we talked about in the previous chapter, heat really flows from the hotter object to the colder object. Uh, iron, for example, is just exposed to a little bit of oxygen, a little bit of moisture is pretty much all you need to form something like rust. So these are all sort of uh, spontaneous processes that occur. Obviously skiing downhill is spontaneous, just gotta go over the edge there and you will go down. Skiing uphill would be a non-spontaneous process, and I imagine not what you want to see if you're coming down the hill, I imagine. But obviously, if you want to go up the hill there, uh, this is not going to happen. You can't sit on the bottom of the hill and just find your way up there. So you do have to apply some type of work, right, to get yourself up the hill. And again, that would not occur, obviously, spontaneously. So a lot of times when we think about these things, <clears throat> you know, we kind of think about energy involved as well. Here's another sort of example. Uh, if we had sort of some gas molecules separated by a valve and we open up the valve, spontaneously those gas molecules are going to sort of escape to the other side and will start to fill it. Uh, opposite, if we started sort of in that situation with gas on both sides, um, they really won't spontaneously all decide, you know, we're just gonna go this way. It's usually not gonna kind of happen that way. You can maybe help it along, maybe heat it a little bit or something like that and kind of force some of them over there. Uh, but they're not gonna spontaneously just kind of head over to the other side uh, by themselves. So when we think about spontaneous reactions, again, sometimes people sort of tie the idea of exothermic uh, to those things. And a reminder, as we talked about in the previous chapter, if we have a delta H value that is negative, that is an exothermic process which means heat and energy is being released. And obviously we have our delta H that is positive. It is going to be an endothermic process. 
and heat and energy is absorbed. So the first couple here, which are spontaneous reactions, combustion reaction, exothermic, releasing energy. It's basically what happens when you light a Bunsen burner. Formation of water here, also exothermic. This is a spontaneous process there. Uh, that's basically ice melting, and we know that happens, right? If you take an ice cube out into the freezer, it's going to melt, right? It's going to just sort of spontaneously pick up that energy and start to do so. Uh, the dissolving of an ionic solid in water will also be sort of positive. And as you probably have some experience with, obviously, you take any type of sort of ionic solid and put it in the water. Most of the time, it should dissolve as long as you don't dump a whole bucket of it in there. So when we look at enthalpy or the delta H for a reaction, obviously the first two here are exothermic, the last two are endothermic. Um, it doesn't necessarily guarantee that the reaction will be um, spontaneous. Um, it does sort of help a lot of times. It being exothermic, you got some of that extra energy sort of there that can be given off that helps everything sort of happen. Uh, but it doesn't necessarily guarantee it. And again, you shouldn't think of a reaction that maybe is a positive delta H value or endothermic as being always non-spontaneous. Um, again, as we can see with those last two examples, we definitely could have some endothermic processes that are spontaneous as well. So if we can't use sort of uh, delta H as sort of the overwhelming sort of factor, if you will, uh, to help us determine sort of spontaneity, there has to be some other sort of things that we look at. And another important thing that we look at is entropy. And entropy is the measure of disorder or randomness in a system. And entropy is a little bit different than enthalpy for a couple of things as we will see as we go through this chapter. First off, delta S just unit wise is different. Uh, usually delta H is in kilojoules. Delta S is typically in joules in terms of units. And we will see an equation a little bit later on in this chapter where we use both of those values together. Uh, so you always want to make sure you watch those units. Otherwise, you'll be off by a factor of a thousand. Also sort of different is the fact that a lot of times when we think about numbers and we think about numbers maybe being negative like delta H and things like that, we sort of think of it as something happening and things like that. With uh, entropy, when the amount of disorder increases, the delta S value actually becomes more positive. So the delta S value becomes positive when there is a lot of disorder or randomness that's happening. And the opposite is true when the amount of disorder decreases. The opposite of that would be order is increasing. When the dis disorder goes down, means the order goes up, the delta S actually becomes a negative value. So that is the change in the entropy. And again, a little bit different than sometimes how we think about things. More positive means more disorder and randomness happening, a more negative number, less uh, disorder, more order is happening in that sort of situation. Entropy uh, is calculated uh, like a state function. We basically take final minus initial, and um, that means if our final state results in greater order, we would expect the delta S to be more negative. And again, if our final state results in more disorder, we would expect it to become a more positive number. Now, <clears throat> one easy way to sort of think about it or see it is like changes of state. So obviously when we have things in the solid state, things are very, very ordered, especially if you have some type of ionic solid, right? Those things have long range order, um, you know, like maybe in 200A, we talked about like cubic cells, unit cells, simple cubic. Those are the arrangements of these guys sort of in three dimensional space and they're very, very ordered. Um, as you go to liquid, things are still relatively close to each other, but because they're liquid, they're more fluid. That means things are moving around, right? And a little bit more disorder that's happening. And obviously when you get to the gas phase, everybody is broken apart from each other. So they're just flying around just like that and obviously causing a lot of uh, disorder that happens. So the entropy of the gas phase is much greater than obviously the entropy that you would find in the solid phase. <clears throat> 
and obviously we'd be heading more positive value this way versus more negative if you kind of went the other way uh, in terms of entropy. <clears throat> Any questions on that there? So when we look at something like this, when we take ice basically to liquid water, again, we're going from solid to liquid state, that should be increasing the disorder and that should result in for this reaction or system here, that the delta S value should end up being a positive number because of that uh, in this particular case. So when we talk about disorder, it is sort of related to probability and a probable event is one that, you know, could happen in many ways. Uh, while an improbable event is one that can happen in only sort of a few ways, you know, so if we were to need to leave this room, there's multiple doors we could go out of. It's pretty probable we would get out if you got a choice of like four doors in this room. Now, if we happen to be in a room with no doors and just a small little window and we had to get out, you know, that might be a little bit more improbable of an event that will occur much, much harder to sort of do that. So a ordered state has a very low probability of occurring and a small entropy. Again, if things are very, very ordered, you pretty much got to put everybody together correctly, right? Everybody's got to kind of line up and then get it together in the sort of the right order there. And you know, there's a few different few ways you could do that. If you have too many things out of order, right? Things are not going to come together correctly. Uh, so again, a much ordered state has a very, uh, low probability of happening and a low entropy. A disordered state has a very high probability of happening and a large entropy. Let's be honest, there's many, many ways you could screw something up, right? You could screw something up a lot more ways probably than doing something correctly. And that's sort of the idea there, right? So um, <clears throat> the greater chance that you will cause disorder than maybe order in a lot of situations. Now there is sort of a formula that relates probability and different ways that things can happen. It's sometimes referred to as the Boltzmann equation. And it is the entropy is equal to uh, K, which is the Boltzmann's constant, which is down here on the bottom. Natural log of W. W is the number of microstates. You could kind of think of it as different ways you could sort of accomplish something. Uh, so just a Visual example of that, we got kind of four circles here. If we wanted to, uh, <clears throat> if we want to put all four circles on one side of a box here, there's really only one way to do that. You're going to put it on the left, which is the same thing if you put them on the right. So there's just one way to do that. If we wanted to do like one circle in a box and three in others, there's four different ways of doing that. And if you wanted to put two on each side there, there are six ways of doing that, right? So when we think about it here, this guy is going to have the lowest entropy. If we plug that into our formula here, the natural log of one, basically. Natural log of one is zero, which pretty much gives us a very small entropy value here, as opposed to if you just plugged it into the equation, the natural log of six, on your calculator, you get something like 1.79, which is a positive number times that, which is obviously a much larger-ish number than zero. So you have a much higher probability. Also like a good carnival game, right? If you had to get a four on one side, probably not gonna happen. But maybe if you only had to get two on a side, there's a greater chance that you might be able to get two on the side tossing like basketballs in those holes that don't fit the basketballs and you gotta toss them in, right? And all those things. I'm just kidding. They're not rigged, those games. <laughs> so these are all processes that uh, basically lead to an increase in the entropy of the system here. So the first one there, obviously in the solid state, as we talked about, uh, they are very ordered, especially like I said, you have something like an ionic solid. It has really long range order. Uh, as I was mentioning before, like a unit cell, you could like take just a little section of it and you can recreate the whole structure just from that because it does repeat uh, very much um, 
over and over again. Obviously, liquid to gas, as we talked about, the process of making a solution also increases to this order because before you basically kind of mix them together, you have your solvent there that's really attached to other solvent like water molecules, right? So before you do anything, you got like your water molecules, which are hydrogen bonded to each other in an ordered sort of fashion. And obviously your solute, which may be an ionic solid, uh, also together in a very ordered fashion. In order to sort of break those guys apart, the water molecules got to break apart, right? Causing disorder in the solvent. And obviously as those water molecules pluck off some of the solute, it's going to be breaking apart the solid, causing disorder there. And obviously the last one there is our temperature. Again, on the right-hand side there, the temperature is a higher temperature. So as the temperature increases, typically things gain more energy, they move faster. You know, if you have a gas molecule, right, you heat it, this can be flying around a lot faster, causing a lot more disorder. What's that old saying? Light a match underneath somebody, right? And they move quicker. So kind of the same idea here. Any questions on any of those there? <clears throat> So a lot of what we're gonna focus on, right, it does go back to some of the stuff we talked about in the previous chapter. And a lot of it has to do with the system and the surroundings. So this still applies here with entropy, obviously just like it applies with the enthalpy that we talked about. Um, so we do look at things oftentimes in those two sort of veins to the system, which as I mentioned before, a lot of times is really the reaction that you're dealing with is oftentimes the system. And again, the surroundings is obviously everything outside of that. So let's take a look at each of these and decide, is it an increase in entropy? Would we expect the entropy change to be positive or negative? So take a moment or two and think about what you think it would be. Okay, let's take a look. So first one, we're condensing water vapor. So condensation uh, does mean we're going from gas back to liquid. So we're going obviously from the gas state, which is things flying around to liquid state where they're not flying around and have dropped basically back into solution. So we're really increasing the order, right? Decreasing the disorder, if you will, which means the delta S here should end up being more negative of a value uh, because of that. You know, you may want to think about these things, you know, either as uh, disorder increasing or decreasing or order increasing, decreasing, or both, I guess. If we form a sucrose crystal, crystal would be like a solid. And usually crystals are fairly organized structures. So that definitely should also increase the order here. Once again, that would mean we're decreasing the disorder. And once again, that should result in a delta S value that is less than zero or negative. Heating hydrogen gas from 60 to 80, that once again is going to cause our gas molecule to fly around faster. Obviously, as it's flying around faster, that should cause a lot more disorder. Right? And that would result in actually our delta S being positive in this case, greater than zero. And lastly here, uh, subliming dry ice, that is sublimation going from solid directly to gas, skip the liquid phase along the way there. And obviously in this case, we're going from solid, which is ordered to gas, which is basically flying around that once again should also increase the disorder here. And our delta S should be a positive number. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> Now, a lot of times in this sort of chapter or a lot of these problems, they will oftentimes necessarily, as we will see, uh, maybe not give you numbers or things like that and just sort of say, hey, this is positive, this is negative, you know, do you expect this reaction to be spontaneous or non-spontaneous? So, you know, there's a lot of questions sometimes in these chapters where, you know, there's not really numbers and stuff like that, but they want you to sort of think about, you know, this is positive, this is negative, you know, sort of what does it mean? Any questions on any of that stuff there? <clears throat> okay. So let's talk a little bit about entropy. Uh, as we just saw the in the other chapter there, entropy is also a state function. And as we talked about previously, you know, state functions really are 
where you start and where you end are really the two most important things. Again, doesn't matter how you get there, just get there some way. And that is gonna be our final minus our initial here. And that is really why in a lot of those things we again do take sort of, when we calculate things like enthalpy, also how we calculate entropy or change in temperature, we do final minus initial. And as we also talked about, right, when we think about <clears throat> reactions, right, products and our reactants, really our products are our final state, right? And our reactants are our initial state. And that again is why, you know, for example, delta H, we go delta H of the products minus delta H of the reactants, our final minus our initial state. And again, that's really why we do those. Here's a table, which clearly you can see all those numbers, <laughs> maybe. And uh, that's a delta S table. So uh, in the back of your book, usually there's usually again, a thermodynamic table where you'll find those delta H values that we talked about in the previous chapter. And you'll also find delta S usually in there and our delta G values as well. As I mentioned earlier, major difference is again, the units between these two things, joules for our S, again, kilojoules for our delta H. Just like when you look up delta H and any of these thermodynamic values, as we talked about, you wanna make sure you not only get the correct substance, but it's also in the right state. Another major difference is if you remember when you look up something like the delta H of O2, it is zero kilojoules. And most things in their standard state that are uncombined, uh, they pretty much will have a delta H value of zero. And that's a little bit different for uh, entropy. You will actually find values for entropy. So you'll find values for things like O2, H2, and so forth. So they actually will have some values. The other thing that you also see is delta H sometimes can be positive or negative, and typically delta S's are usually positive values when you look at them. Uh, they're up in a table. <clears throat> So that does bring us to sort of what we're talking about here um, in this particular chapter. The first law of thermodynamics is sort of what we were talking about with the energy. And as we talked about, right, energy can be converted from one form to the next, but we do not create it nor destroy it. And we sort of talked about the idea of sort of a perfect energy exchange, if you will. If somebody loses a certain amount of energy, obviously somebody else should gain that certain amount of energy. The number will be the same, but the signs will be different. One will be negative for the guy losing it and giving it off. And obviously the one absorbing it will be a positive number in that case. The second law of thermodynamics deals with the entropy of the universe increases in a spontaneous process and remains unchanged in an equilibrium process. So one way that we could use delta S to figure out whether or not a reaction is spontaneous is to calculate what is sometimes referred to as the delta S of the universe. And basically the universe is made up of two things. It is our system and our surroundings. And we're gonna talk about how to calculate each of those in just a second. Also a reminder that the system is usually the reaction. So sometimes you'll see delta S of the reaction is asked of you. And that's really the same thing as delta S of the system in most cases. So if you happen to add up those two guys together and calculate the delta S of the universe and you do get a positive number, then the reaction will be spontaneous. Um, you do need both of those values to make that determination of is it a spontaneous reaction or not. Uh, and you have to calculate the delta S of the universe to do that. If you obviously calculate the delta S of the universe and it's a negative number, then it would be a non-spontaneous process. Um, and if you calculate the delta S of the universe and it's zero, it's an equilibrium process. Um, again, if it's at equilibrium, like we talked about in equilibrium reactions, rate of the forward reaction and the reverse reaction basically equal each other, which means there's really a net nothing much happening other than maintaining what you have going on at that point. And uh, that's why our, our delta S will equal zero in that case. So let's talk about first how to calculate the delta S of the system or the reaction. 
So to do this, we really do final minus initial. So just like what we would do with our delta H, if we're just given an equation and asked what is the delta S of the reaction, are the system, and again, these are sometimes pretty much the same thing in most cases. Uh, we would go to the table, we would look up the values and much like what we did with our delta H problem, we would add up all the entropy of our products. We would also need to make sure that we do multiply by the coefficients like we did with our delta H's. And we would subtract it from our initial here, all the delta S's for our reactants, also making sure that we multiply by the coefficients there. And again, this will give us our delta S of the system or the reaction. Put some arrows in there. All right, so once you try one here, these would be the delta S values that you would find in a table. So uh, see what you come up with. Look, I'm missing one there. Is it on your handout? What is CO2? 213.6, thank you. I feel like I'm missing one there. Okay, let's take a look. So once again, if these are not provided for you, you would go look those up in a table. Sometimes people wanna know about the little knot that you sometimes see on sort of thermodynamic values and stuff like that. So you can kind of think of the knot as sort of standard conditions. Um, so when we talk about sort of standard conditions, if we're talking about pressures, everybody's at one atmosphere. If we're talking about concentrations, everybody's at one molar, and typically the temperature is 25 degrees Celsius. It's almost like a table sort of conditions that you find in most uh, tables is what that sort of means. Uh, so if we were to calculate our delta S here, we would again take our products, which would be two because of the coefficient here, times the value of CO2 that we would find in the table. That takes care of all of our products. We then would subtract it from our reactants. Once again, we want to take two times the, co uh, the value there for CO, which is 197.9. We're then going to add it for our value for O2, which is 205. Here I'm not multiplying by anything because the coefficient there is one. And if we do that, end up with, I think, on this calculator here, minus 173.6 joules. A question on that calculation. Now, does this number tell us that this reaction is spontaneous or non-spontaneous? The answer is it doesn't. Right, so this is not the delta S of the universe. This is just the delta S of the reaction. But what it does tell us is in this particular reaction, are we increasing or decreasing the disorder? So we did end up with a negative value for delta S and negative means that we are actually increasing the order or decreasing the disorder, right? However, why you wanna word and think about it, order or disorder and that type of thing. But basically we're getting more ordered. And we could actually, if we wanted to, before we even did the calculation, just by looking at the equation, we could make that prediction. And I can make that prediction because when I look at this equation, I got some gas molecules on both sides. How many gas molecules do I have on the reactant side? I have three gas molecules on the reactant side. So I got three things flying around. On the product side, how many do I end up with? Two. So I actually decreased the amount of gas molecules that are flying around, which means if you had three things flying around in your face, that would be quite annoying, but maybe two would be a little less annoying, right? A little more ordered has been established in here. So by just recognizing that we actually produce less gas molecules than we started with, we actually know that we increase the order and we should expect the value for this reaction for delta S to actually be negative, which it is. So that's a good way to kind of check your calculation, make sure you know it does sort of make sense. Any questions on that? Yeah. 
Right. It has nothing to do with necessarily the delta H here. And as we saw in the earlier slide, uh, you can have exothermic reactions that are spontaneous and you can have uh, endothermic reactions that are spontaneous. But in terms of uh, just in terms of the number of gas molecules here that were created is actually less than what we started with. So it's kind of like a little bit more order has been established here based on the reaction. Other questions? <clears throat> I'm not sure I understand final initial of oh yeah so the 25 degrees Celsius is, is, is a lot of times put into these problems and there are equations we'll see that you need to use a temperature value uh, but there are some that you don't and one like this really uh, it's really just telling you 25 degrees that it's sort of standard conditions again kind of like what the little knot sort of represents that if you go to the table, most sort of tables that you find in like books and stuff like that, uh, that's a standard temperature that most things are done under and you would look them up under those standard conditions. So if you're asked to calculate the delta S, you don't have to do anything with the temperature here, uh, but we will see some equations down the road here that does have a temperature sort of component that you need to use it. Also, if you are given a problem like this and it just kind of gives you the reaction and asks you to calculate the delta S, but really doesn't mention temperature, it's probably safe to assume that it's 25 degrees and it's under standard conditions. You can go to a table and kind of look up those values. Other questions? <clears throat> so as I mentioned before, by just looking at the equation, you could really make a fairly good prediction of what your value should end up with. Um, you know, if you, especially if you have gas molecules involved, um, if the reaction again produces more gas molecules than you started with, that would be really the opposite of what we just saw there. Uh, we would have more things flying around at the end, right? So that would be a lot more disorder sort of happening. Um, and obviously the second thing there is what happened in the previous problem. We actually ended up with less gas molecules flying around, again, creating a little bit more of order. If you have sort of an equal amount of gas molecules on both sides, then you may have a positive or negative delta S, uh, but you'll probably have a relatively small number depending on sort of which side you end up on. So if we had to predict here based on this reaction, would we expect delta, delta S for this reaction to be positive or negative in this case? Yes, yeah, so on this case, uh, we are starting with one gas molecule, that's a solid. And over here, this is no gas molecules, right? So we obviously have produced less gas molecules than what we started with. And then as you said, that should definitely create some order. So we would expect this delta S here to be negative. Any questions on that? And again, like I said earlier, that's sometimes a lot of questions that you will come across in this chapter where it's like, just look at it and decide, you know, based on what's going on, do you expect it either to be positive, negative, or spontaneous, non-spontaneous, that type of thing. All right, so that was delta S of the system or just around, uh, the system or the reaction, which again, you calculate based off of products minus reactants. You go to a table, look up the values to do that. So let's talk about the other component to the delta S of the universe, which is the surroundings. Now the delta S of the surroundings is affected by, in some cases, the actual heat that may be released or absorbed. Here we have the system giving off heat and energy to the surroundings. So what we would expect perhaps to happen in a sort of normal situation is if a reaction gives off heat and energy to the surroundings, that means the surroundings is gonna pick up all that heat and energy, which means the disorder in the surroundings should start to increase, right? They're gonna pick up energy, they're gonna be moving around faster and stuff like that, gonna be causing more disorder. So in an exothermic process, the delta S of the surroundings would be greater than zero or positive because it's picking up that energy from the system and going a little crazy all over the place. Opposite is sort of true here in a kind of normal-ish situation. 
if the surroundings is actually giving off the energy to the system, what we expect to happen in terms of the surroundings is everybody in the surroundings is gonna lose some energy, which means they're not gonna be moving around as fast, right? And that's gonna create a little bit more order in the surroundings. And because of that, we would expect our delta S of the surroundings to actually be a negative number. So here the delta H of the reaction does play a role in the surroundings entropy. And what we see here is that the delta S of the surroundings is proportional to negative the delta H of the system or the reaction. So that's what that little symbol is, a proportional sort of symbol is supposed to be. So what does that mean? So if we just kind of sketch it up here, delta S of the surroundings versus our delta negative delta H of the reaction or the system. If I have a exothermic reaction, delta H should be positive or negative? Negative, which means I have a negative and a negative, which gives me a positive value for our surroundings and increase in the entropy. Opposite is true if I have an endothermic reaction. Endothermic reaction is a positive value for delta H. Negative times a positive gives me a negative number, right? And then we see a decrease. So that's what it means there. It is negative of the delta H of the reaction. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> Does the surrounding temperature itself play a role in what you might see in terms of the entropy change and for the surroundings? What happens if my surrounding temperature is like super high to begin with? Would I see a big change in the entropy if it gains some energy from the reaction? The answer is probably not that much of a change, right? So a bad example would be if you had your match and you struck a match just in the open, you would feel the heat, right? If you had your oven up to the highest temperature and struck the match and put the match in the oven, the amount of heat coming off that match is probably not gonna make a very big difference to the heat that's already in the oven and it's not gonna make a big amount of change. So the actual temperature of the surroundings does play a role in it. If you're starting with a relatively large surrounding temperatures, the change in entropy may not be that big. Um, but again, under sort of normal surrounding temperatures and normal conditions, you know, you will see this sort of change that we just talked about that if it's an exothermic reaction, we would see an increase in the entropy of the surroundings. Well, if it's endothermic, we would see uh, a sort of decrease in it. So to calculate the delta S of the surroundings, <laughs> things moved around here, delta S of the surroundings is equal to minus or delta H of the system or the reaction divided by the temperature in Kelvin. Now this equation right here is sort of the second part that you would need to be add to what we did earlier, which was the delta S of the system, or the reaction, is our delta S of our products minus the delta S of our reactants. Again, taking both of these guys together will give us our delta S of our universe, which is our delta S of our system plus the delta S of our surroundings. And again, by having both of those components, we then can calculate the delta S of the universe. And again, if you end up with one that is greater than zero, then that reaction would be spontaneous. So individually here, they really don't tell us if the reaction is gonna be spontaneous or not. Again, for the system, uh, it tells us whether or not we are increasing or decreasing the disorder in the reaction in the system. Uh, but again, putting both of these values together, uh, we will end up um, calculating the delta S of the universe and be able to make that determination if it is a spontaneous reaction. You do also want to, again, be very careful here of units. And what I mean by that is 
from the table values, you're gonna end up in joules. And in most cases, once again, this is gonna be given to you in kilojoules, which means when you get down here, you should probably pick one, yeah? And again, you might wanna pick joules because it's commonly given, usually given in joules, but it doesn't really matter. But you do need to make sure when you go to add them together that you're not adding joules and kilojoules together. Otherwise, obviously you will get the wrong answer. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> All right, so why don't we try one here, see what we end up with. Here's some values. And uh, again, once again, I feel like I deleted one. No, there it is, N2, H2, got them there. So here's our delta S values from the table that you would look up. And here's our reaction and our delta H value given to you. Let's calculate all these things, system, surrounding, and is this reaction spontaneous, which means you should probably calculate the universe as well in this process. So take a couple minutes, see what you come up with. Okay, let's take a look. So uh, we'll start with the system here, which is the reaction. So delta S of our system. Again, we're gonna do products minus reactants. And once again, not always given to you, probably never given to you in a book problem. You will have to probably reference, obviously the table in the back of the book. And again, that is where you would find those values. Uh, so we're gonna do our products here, which is uh, two NH3. So we're gonna take two times the value that we got there for NH3, uh, which is a uh, buck 93 there. That takes care of all of our products. We're then gonna subtract it from our reactants. And we have just one N2, which would be 192. And we're going to add that to our other reactant, which is hydrogen, and there's three of them. So we wanna multiply it by three, uh, 131 there. All right, so if we do that here on the trusty calculator, I'm not sure how trusty this calculator is, but we'll give it a try. 192 plus uh, three times 131, one more of those maybe. I got here a minus 199 joules for the delta S of the system. Any questions on that one there? <clears throat> now, does that negative make sense? It does if we look at the equation, right? We started with four gas molecules and we ended with two. So we went from a lot more gas molecules flying around to less gas molecules flying around. That should increase the order and we should expect the delta S of our reaction to be a negative number, which it was. So that's all good. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> Next would be our delta S of the surroundings we want to calculate here. So uh, <clears throat> our delta S of our surroundings is once again minus the delta H of the reaction divided by the temperature. So here, as to an earlier question, we do need to use the temperature for this part of the calculation. So that's a 25 plus a 273 gives us a 298 in terms of the temperature. So putting in our number here, not forgetting to use the negative that's in the formula. And we're going to take a negative 92.6. I personally am gonna multiply it by a thousand to convert it to joules. So I just get that out of the way here. Um, and I'm gonna divide it by 298. And that's gonna give me uh, 92.6 times a thousand uh, divided by 298. And roughly, it looks like on my calculator, we'll call it 311. Mine would be joules in this case because I did the conversion already. Obviously, if you left it in kilojoules, you're looking at like a 0 0.311 kilojoules, yes. Again, you can technically, although in most cases, S's are normally sort of given in joules, but if it doesn't specify, you can. The problem, you just want to make sure you do avoid is the next thing that we need to do, which is to calculate the delta S of the universe. So we're gonna calculate our delta S of the universe. And that is gonna be the delta S of our system plus the delta S of our surroundings. 
So here, if you did leave it in kilojoules, you got to convert it to joules. Or again, you got to convert the other one to kilojoules. You don't want to add them, obviously, in the different units. So personally, I will do that a lot in this chapter. You'll see me like convert everything to joules just to kind of keep everybody in the same units. And you don't have to. You can convert everybody to kilojoules if you want. And really, if they don't specify units, you really could give it any unit you want. Although, normally speaking, delta S is usually kilojoules. S is usually joules. And Gibbs free energy that we'll talk about is also usually kilojoules. So those are the common sort of units. So I'm good to go because I do have them all obviously in the same units. If you do not, you should do again some type of conversion there. So we're going to take minus 199 uh, plus 311. That gets us uh, like a 112 joules here for the delta S of the universe. First off, any questions on the calculation there? Is this reaction spontaneous? This reaction is, yes, it is spontaneous. And which of those three values am I looking at to make that determination? It is this last one, is what I'm looking at to make that determination. It is the universe value there that is greater than zero and positive, which means it is spontaneous. By the way, again, this is a very good illustration of this reaction is spontaneous, but it is super slow if you don't throw a catalyst in there. So it will happen, but it will happen very slow, and you can speed it up by adding a catalyst. But again, just because it is spontaneous doesn't mean it's fast or slow. Um, that's, again, the kinetics of it. So let's talk about these numbers again, just to verify that everything really does sort of make sense based on what we've been talking about. Once again, we talked about the delta S of the system, which is minus 199. That negative number means we created more order by making less gas molecules than we started with. The delta H for this reaction is minus 92, which means it's negative. So the delta H means this reaction is endothermic or exothermic. The delta H is negative, which means it is exothermic, which means this reaction is giving off energy to the surroundings. And it's like a normal temperature of 25 degrees, which means that extra energy that's going into the surroundings should then make the surroundings a little bit more crazy, right? Because they are picking up the energy. And we should see that the entropy of the surroundings should actually be positive, which is exactly what we see here with our calculation. And then obviously putting now both of those components together, we end up with overall a more positive delta S of the universe, which tells us it is spontaneous. Yes. Are, are you talking about um, like where it may not make a difference? Is that right? Um, yeah, so 25 is sort of normal conditions and you know, you know, when you start getting into maybe hundreds of degrees Celsius and stuff like that are really high 800 or something like that, you know, there are some extremes. There's, there's not necessarily, to answer your question, like a temperature that works for everything. You know what I'm trying to say? Like, it is obviously dependent on, it is dependent on uh, the delta H and, and all those kind of things in terms of, yeah. 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 So you can actually, uh, you could actually sort of, uh, you could actually figure it out by setting it equal to zero because then that wouldn't be less than that would be negative, right? So you could actually really solve for it in a particular reaction. You know, you could kind of solve for it based on uh, if you knew the entropy, for example, of the surroundings you then can kind of back calculate the temperature that, you know, which sort of gets you a, a more like a negative number. We're gonna do something similar to that in an example coming up in just a second, which might, might answer your question as well. So we'll do something similar where uh, we, we will find a, we'll find a reaction where it's non-spontaneous, for example, and then uh, we could do a calculation where we could figure out, you know, what, what temperature would it become spontaneous, you know, what temperature would you need it for that to happen? Uh, so we're going to look at something like that, which is similar to what you're talking about. But 
you know, it will vary depending obviously on the reaction as to, you know, what temperature would be that. But under normal conditions, you know, if you start getting to maybe triple digits in terms of Celsius, in terms of temperature, you know, you're probably reaching a point where it may not make a tremendous difference in terms of the entropy that you would see. Other questions? <clears throat> okay, questions on entropy, how to calculate any parts of it and uh, how to use it to make your decision there. Okay. So the next thing we're gonna talk about after we talk about this <laughs> is the uh, third law of thermodynamics, which is the entropy of a perfect crystal basically has uh, an entropy of zero at absolute zero temperature, which again is basically our Kelvin um, temperature scale. This is what we saw earlier. Again, a perfect crystal, if it's perfect, there's pretty much only one way to be perfect, they say. So that's gonna give us a delta S of zero in this case. We also, as we talked about with our heating and cooling curve, and this is sort of uh, flipped around a little bit, but we do see an, an increase in the entropy, obviously, as we go from the solid to liquid to the gas. And obviously, if you're headed the other way, we see a, a decrease in the entropy. But we also can talk about, and we will talk about here in a bit, uh, the entropy of sort of phase changes. Right. So in the previous chapter, we talked about that as we change the phase of a substance, it does happen at two points really, right? The melting point or the freezing point, right? And that's when you go from your solid to liquid or backwards. And if you remember the energy required to do that is our heat of fusion, as we talked about in the previous chapter. And obviously the bigger one here is happens at the normal boiling point. And that is obviously when we go from liquid to gas or gas back to liquid. And remember the energy required to do that is the delta H of vaporization. We also have at those sort of transitions, what is referred to as the delta S of fusion, which is the entropy change that occurs as you go from solid to liquid and obviously liquid back to a uh, solid. Now, it would follow the same sort of logic for us as we talked about. Obviously, if we go from solid to liquid, we're increasing the order. So that would be a positive sort of value that would happen. And if we head the other way, we should end up with a negative value. And those would correspond to our delta H values that occur this way. Our delta H value here for our system, if it's going from solid to liquid would be positive and negative heading in that direction as well. And then we see the same thing here at the delta S of vaporization, which is our transition from liquid to gas and gas back to liquid. Again, going from liquid to gas, we would expect a positive value, therefore our vaporization and a negative value going the opposite way as we create more order. Before we kind of move on from that equation for the surroundings, and again, it may not make a lot of sense at this point, but we will see a, an equation very similar to this one a little bit later on where we do some rearranging of an equation. The difference though is the one where we rearrange and I'll point it out when we get there, will not have the negative sign. So the negative sign here is really important always for the surroundings when you're calculating delta S the surroundings. If you're sort of using a formula and rearranging for the delta S, which we'll do a little bit later on, you will end up with something that looks exactly like that without the negative. And sometimes people want to put the negative in there. So that negative there, just keep that in mind, really just for the delta S and the surroundings. And if you sort of get to this equation by rearranging a formula, you should obviously not put the negative in there. And that's something that happens a lot when people kind of do that. So since we don't really want to calculate perhaps all the time the delta S of the universe, there is another sort of value that we could use to actually help us just sort of directly calculate whether or not a reaction is going to be spontaneous. And that is what is known as Gibbs free energy. Gibbs free energy is delta G. And much like the name implies, as I mentioned earlier, it is basically free energy that's available to do some type of work is basically what Gibbs free energy is. And there's actually, I don't know, 
maybe three or four different ways you could calculate delta G depending on sort of the information given to you. So as we go through the rest of this chapter here, my best piece of advice is calculate it based on the information given to you, what kind of fits. One way that you could calculate the, the delta G for a reaction is the delta G is equal to the delta H minus T delta S. This is our enthalpy. This is our temperature in Kelvin. And this is obviously our entropy. This is definitely the equation where once again, units give people some trouble. Once again, that is going to probably be in kilojoules. That is going to be in joules. So again, it really is your choice. You can convert them either way, either to joules or to kilojoules but you need to make sure, again, those guys are definitely in the same units. I will see delta G is oftentimes given in kilojoules when it's all said and done is sort of the value that typically is uh, given. If you calculate the delta G and it is less than zero, the reaction is spontaneous in the forward direction, which means basically the way it's written, it is spontaneous. If you reverse a reaction, the delta G becomes the opposite sign, which means it would become positive if you went the reverse way. If delta G is positive, the reaction is non-spontaneous as it's written. But again, if you flip the reaction around and reverse the reaction, your products become your reactants, your reactants become your products and the sign will change and it would become spontaneous in the reverse direction. And if you have a delta G that's equal to zero, you're at an equilibrium sort of process at that point. Um, so this is again, one way that you could calculate delta G. And again, if you were given or calculated the H and the S, this would be the way to go. Just throw it at this equation and calculate it um, based off of it. Again, you also sometimes see the knots on all these which would again mean more of a standard condition type situation as well. <clears throat> now you can as well calculate delta G, just like we kind of calculate everything else like H and S. You can take your products minus your reactants. You could go to a table and look up delta G values. They're sometimes referred to as delta G of formation with the F on the bottom there and that is basically how much uh, energy there is in one mole of the compound when they are formed from their sort of elements in their standard states. Just like all the other thermodynamic values, you wanna again make sure the correct substance and also the state of everybody. Just like delta H, you will find zeros for values in things in their uh, uncombined elemental form. So things like O2, H2 will be zero here. So it really is only entropy that you'll actually have values for these guys. And earlier we were talking about sort of standard conditions and this is basically what any table that you look up in like a book is basically technically done at. If you're dealing with pressures, once again, it is one atmosphere, one molar for concentrations. And again, the temperature is typically 25 degrees Celsius. So right there is two different ways that you can calculate the delta G for the reaction. This would obviously be a situation where you're frankly just given the reaction and ask what is the delta G of it and you would go to the table and do products minus reactants. Again, you would also multiply by the coefficients like we did in all the other ones there. Uh, and like I said before, if you were sort of given the delta H value and the S value, then you would probably plug it into the other equation uh, to calculate the delta G. So while we try one here, what is the standard free energy change for the following reaction? And is it spontaneous? And here's our, I believe, delta G values down here. O2 would be zero kilojoules. Okay, so let's take a look. So again, in this problem, you don't wanna reinvent the wheel. You don't wanna to try to go calculate H and then calculate S and put it into that equation. Might as well just go look up the delta G values that you would find here on the bottom. And again, these would be in a table. Uh, so once again, we're gonna do our products minus our reactants here. So we will end up with on the product side, 12 times our CO2, which looks like minus 
We're then going to add it to six times my water value, which you know might be right value off of that table or not, but we'll go with it. There we go. And that takes care of our product. We're gonna then subtract our reactants. So we got two times our 124.5 plus 15 basically times zero here. And we end up uh, with I believe it is minus sixty four hundred kilojoules. We agree. That's good. Never know with this calculator. I'll eventually find my right one. Uh, first off, any question on the calculation here? That would mean that we ended up with a delta G value that is negative, which means this reaction is going to be spontaneous. Yeah. So this reaction here would be spontaneous because we have a negative delta G in this particular case. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> All right, we're going to 